Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Rebel Daily live stream where we break down stories not only in Canada but all over the world. We are your hosts, Matt Brebner and I'm Dakota Christmas. Indeed. Thank you so much for joining me today, Matt. I myself am in the Rebel News HQ studio here in Toronto. We've got Matt Brevner out in Vancouver. So good to be on with you today, Matt. Um, I actually don't, I don't think we've ever hosted a live stream together, have we? I don't think we have. I think maybe there was one uh, a while back with someone else. Maybe it was with Andrew, but I don't think yeah. the two of us have ever gone at it. So Yeah, so this is, yeah. is going to be really great. I'm really looking forward to this. And yeah, again, for those of you who don't know the deal, this is the daily live stream. We break down the news of the day for you. We go through a bunch of headlines. We'll give you our own takes. Um, and if you would like to interact with us, of course, whether you are on, actually, unfortunately, if you're on YouTube, you can't do that. They've demonetized us. But if you are on Rumble, Odyssey, Getter, any of those other platforms, go ahead, send us your paid chats. We'll read them out. We'd love to interact with all of you. So please do, and uh, yeah, I think uh, without further ado, we might as well get in on, uh, on some of the headlines of today and the breaking news that's going on. So I think first up on the docket here, Matt, is something that you've reported on yourself in Vancouver um, pretty extensively. I've loved seeing your coverage of this. I think it's a really important issue, and there's a lot of nuance to it. I don't think a lot of people um, have been paying attention to or really think hard enough about. So we've been seeing that in Vancouver, the downtown east side, they've started clearing away these uh, tent cities that have been uh, really plaguing the area. And it's such a significant issue that you've covered so extensively. So I would love to hear your takes on this and have you sort of explain what the deal is, what's going on here in Vancouver. Sure, yeah, I'd love to share. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with Vancouver's downtown east side, um, for longer than five decades, it's essentially been a hot spot for uh, drug abuse, uh, prostitution, violent crime, gang crime, gang violence, and mental health issues. And essentially, uh, furthermore, in the last two or three years, there have been tent encampments that have been popping up um, throughout the city, uh, first in Oppenheimer Park, and then uh, just off of Venables, and then back at Oppenheimer Park. And now, most recently, uh, tents have been popping up right in front of establishments on Hastings Street. Now, that's always been kind of a, a rough area, but uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, it's just become even worse. And, you know, I, I, I don't claim to have the answer uh, as to what to do to fix this. However, um, this is a community of people that really need help. And walking down there, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to just drive by and say, oh my goodness, because the, the visuals are just so shocking. But ultimately, these are people, you know, these are someone's, it's cliche, but it's someone's mother, someone's uh, daughter, someone's son, someone's brother, and these people just really need help. And instead of being used for, you know, political fodder or uh, leverage for back and forth, I, I, it's, the, the issue is becoming so big that there's nothing, you know, we can't avoid it anymore. So anyways, uh, there was a fire at the beginning of July, a church burnt down. Um, the fire uh, a media spokesperson, Matthew Trudeau, no relation to the prime minister. He was, uh, they're claiming that one of these tent camps had a propane, a propane tank in it, and that caused the fire mm. of the street to down on the street. So because of that, the fire team issued a decree saying that all the tents had to be removed uh, because of fire hazard, fire safety, which makes sense. However, you know, I, I can't corroborate this, but speaking to some people who were actually there on the scene said that they didn't, uh, some people seem to think that it was an arson. Uh, that's not substan that's not a substantiated claim. But walking down the side, that's a that are actually um, so. Oh, I'm getting some. Yeah, yeah. So I'm having some issues with the audio there, just a little bit. Um, Sorry, folks. Please do bear with us. Yeah. So, guys, we are having some technical difficulties. We definitely do want to get back in onto the topic because we think it's such an important issue, and there's so much more to come. We're going to throw it to an ad real quick off the bat here. Please do stay with us while we get this sorted out. We will be right back. <laughs>
So I absolutely love having the opportunity to chat with you, to chat with our ever-growing audience. But I'd actually love for you to have that opportunity as well. We actually have advertising opportunities available with rebelnews.com. We don't get handouts from the government. We trust on supporters, viewers, and advertisers like you. So instead of folks listening to me in this spot, they could actually be checking out your company, getting information about your business. For more information or to advertise with us, send an email to ads at rebelnews.com. Hey folks, check out the newest arrival to the Rebel News Store. Yes, F is for Fidel and F is for father? I mean, could it be? Yes, it, half this photo, the colored half, is Justin Trudeau. The black and white half is a young Fidel Castro. Wait now, or is it vice versa? It's so confusing. I'm a huge Forensic Files fan. Wouldn't it be great if we could have piece of Justin's DNA and a piece of Fidel's DNA and put the rumor to bed once and for all. But in the meantime, we'll just have to walk around wearing this shirt, hinting at a great Canadian conspiracy. Or is it? In any event, if you want to get this shirt, folks, go to the Rebel News Store and check this out. Type in our new discount code, that's SUMMER. S-U-M-M-E-R, and if you buy two unisex t-shirts, you get an additional one for free. What a deal. Like I said, Justin Trudeau, Fidel Castro, as they used to say on the ABC detergent ads, can you tell the difference? I can't tell the difference. All right, I think we have everything sorted. Thanks so much, everyone, for staying with us. Matt, can you hear me, and can I hear you? I can, yeah. Am I coming all in right. clean? I think Sorry I hear that. you. I hear you all good and clean. That's great. I mean, this stuff happens. Glad live we got streams. that sorted. Good old live stream. Everything's live. Live in studio. <laughs> Matt in your home studio as it happens. So thanks, everyone, for being the best viewers and for being so patient with us as we get all this sorted. Uh, so I guess we were talking about Vancouver's downtown east side and sort of clearing of these massive tent encampments there that has been going on and sort of breaking down the issue because you, Matt, have been covering this yourself pretty extensively. So you were talking about uh, the church fire that had happened, the propane tank that was in the tent and some people speculating whether there was arson involved. So why don't you take us forward from, uh, from there, what you were talking about? Right, so essentially since that church burnt down, the uh Vancouver Chief uh, Fire Chief Karen Fry issued a decree saying that all these tent encampments that had popped up on, on East Hastings, spanning about three blocks, uh, needed to be removed because of uh, fire hazard, which, you know, obviously is reasonable. However, um, these people have absolutely nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that have nothing or less than nothing. So um, while we were down there uh, last week, we heard some, some of the people we, we spoke to said they're not going to go without a fight. So I guess that leads us to what's happening right now uh, with a violent altercation between BPD and some residents, which unfortunately I'm not surprised has happened. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we're able to throw to that at all, uh, the cold water yeah, article. Yeah, I imagine we could pull up that article there. That Because uh, the article itself, I believe, is just detailing the fact that this was happening, that the, they were beginning to remove these encampments and that there was essentially a street brawl between the cops and between residents uh, who were there because, I mean, it is such an intense and heated and complex issue. So I figure, like, if you just read this article, there's not a lot of nuance behind what a lot of the issues are that are plaguing the community and the people who are there on the street. And so I think, uh, I think it's, it's great to have you talking about this, Matt, because I feel like you understand a lot better than the average person would um, some of these issues that are at play here. Unless you've, you know, it's it's just a Vancouver thing. If you mm -hmm. if you grew up in Vancouver or in British Columbia, you just kind of know what it's about. A drug culture is so rampant in British Columbia. Um, it's it's worse here than anywhere else in the world. I didn't really understand until I started traveling. Um, you know, when I when I became an adult, uh, how ingrained drug culture, not only abuse but recreational drug use, is in in British Columbian culture. I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, it just is a way, a way of life here. And Hastings is kind of like the, unfortunately, it's like kind of the drunk uncle that no one pays attention to at Thanksgiving. And we just kind of let it, let it exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. These, the people, when, when, the, when the Oppenheimer Park encampment was, was t torn down, the people there were promised permanent housing. 
uh, through SROs or what have you, and that just never came. So um, I think taking it to Hastings Street, what I'm kind of gathering from the people on location is that it's a, it just, it's a bit of a form of protest. Like they want to be seen by mm -hmm. the public so that the public will get, you know, uh, will empathize with the situation. Hopefully something will come of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an expensive issue. It's not one that's easily fixed because also a lot of the people that are living down there, they don't want to go to SROs and they don't want permanent mm -hmm. housing because the permanent housing situations are violent. Um, there, there is, some people claim it's even harder for them to stay clean in these social housing situations because of the, the drug trade and it's so rampant there. So it's, it's not as easy as even saying, hey, let's build a thousand you know, studio apartments and put them in there or whatever else. It's, 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 it's a mental health crisis mm -hmm. and I don't see it getting any better anytime soon. And honestly, anyone who claims to have the solution or the answer, they're, they're not being fully truthful. Um, yeah, yeah, and it, it all around is just such a heartbreaking situation because no matter what way, like no matter what actions are being taken right now, uh, there's some sort of tragedy going on, whether it's those who are on the street who are suffering or those who are being impacted by that. And it's just sort of this vicious cycle that I think we're seeing. And it's, yeah, it's sad. I mean, I, I'm, of course, no expert on the topic, but it is, it is just heartbreaking to see. And it would be, you know, of course, I'm very hopeful that you know, it's, it's an issue that we could make some headway on, but yeah, it's just such a tough sort of nut to crack there in terms of like what can really be done and what is the most effective way to go out dealing with it. So yeah, I would be uh, interested to hearing what people in the, uh, in the comments think, mm -hmm. uh, because obviously British Columbia now is launching a pilot program, uh, with the federal government to criminalize illicit drugs under two and a half grams. So heroin, amphetamines, you name it, it's going to be legal to use under two and a half grams and carry on you as of January 1st. Um, obviously, hearing that it's inflammatory and speaking to some addicts that are on the street, you know, I've, I've got firsthand accounts, people saying that this is going to make it actually very difficult for people to stay clean. And this is going to be, you know, this is going to encourage children to try drugs because then it's like, well, what's wrong with heroin? It's legal. I can try it. On the other hand, uh, people who are advocates and proponents of this policy are, are claiming that uh, one of the hardest parts for the rehabilitation process and something that kind of clogs up our, our prison systems is drug offenses, especially people that are using. So even if someone gets clean, once they have a criminal record, they can't get a job, they can't get an apartment. Even in Vancouver, you, you know, you need a clean record and a credit check now to get an apartment. Once it's, it shows basically on your file that you've ever collected welfare, ever had a criminal record or ever lived in an SRO, you're basically doomed to this glass ceiling of, you know, at best part-time work and social assistance. So there has to be a way to also to rehabilitate these people and reassimilate them for the ones that really want to, because obviously it's not hard, it's not easy to get clean off off of uh, something like heroin and actually you know reclaim your life. However, for those who are willing and able, I think there needs to be a, a way to uh, reassimilate these people. So not only that they can be dignified and have a life, but also they're not a burden on the taxpayer either. So there needs to be like a fine balance. I don't know if decriminalizing for the whole province is necessarily that fine balance because obviously people who are in northern northern bc have nothing to do with the people on the downtown east side yet the drugs are just as accessible so maybe some sort of safe zone you know between like clark and canby or something i don't know i don't i don't claim to have the answer but it needs to be more nuanced than that and i i'm concerned about what this new policy is going to bring to be honest mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely hear you there. And like you were saying, I'd love to hear uh, what viewers have to say. So if you got any comments for us, please do send them. We'll read them out. We'll discuss a little further. Um, moving on from that, uh, one of the other, you know, probably the biggest headline in the world right now is the fact that Donald Trump's personal residence in Mar-a-Lago in Florida was raided by the FBI. That's been dominating the headlines over the past couple of days. And what's the latest development on that with the Canadian angle is that uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Finance Minister, Trudeau's number two woman, Christian Freeland, uh, has weighed in on it, or not weighed in, depending. Uh, we have a clip here to throw in when she was asked about it, about her thoughts, and here's what she had to say, and we'll get into this a little bit. Thank you. And looking south, are you surprised to learn former President Donald Trump's residence was raided? Do you think he'll be charged? And based on what's come to light from the January 6th hearings, do you think Trump should be allowed to be president again? You know, being here today, I have been talking a lot about our experience during the NAFTA negotiations and reflecting a lot on that experience. Um, and, you know, reflecting with some appropriately quiet but confident Canadian pride. 
we got through a hard time and we got through it with a win for Canada, a win which is being reinforced by the Inflation Reduction Act. One of my principles during the NAFTA negotiations was that it was my job to comment on and talk about Canadian issues and affairs and I would leave it to the Americans to talk about their own politics and I think I'm going to continue to follow that rule today. Now Matt, you pointed out something to me when we were talking about before the live stream uh, about just how hypocritical her refusal to comment is. Uh, why don't you walk us through that? Well, I just think it's, it's uh, rich because uh, neither Freeland nor the Prime Minister had any problem commenting on uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned and essentially offering abortion tourism for any American uh, that wanted to come here, which, you know, is sows great distrust in our, our basically our best ally, uh, undermines their uh, democratic process. Not only that, it grossly misrepresents what the overturning of Roe v. Wade even means. So mm -hmm. the fact that they don't want to comment on American politics, I think that's just ridiculous because basically all of our policies that are coming out of this conserv or this uh, liberal uh, government are based on American politics and just piggybacking American issues and then somehow making them our own. Like not mm -hmm. to mention, you know, and not to segue, but we're, you know, Dre and I are producing a uh, documentary on the Kamloops residential school and you know, it's, I'd be amiss to not assert that the, our Canadian institutions tried to make that into like our very own George Floyd moment. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, a little bit of digging, you can see verbatim, that's actually what they were trying to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think it's funny because since when did, did they have an issue uh, commenting or taking the moral high ground on American politics? I just think it's, it's a ridiculous yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like not just like, so the recent overturning of, uh, of Roe v. Wade, they were more than happy to jump in on that, like you were saying. Um, like other things like gun violence, they would use uh, gun violence in the states. They'd point to that and say, look, this is, this is you know, another reason why we feel so justified to clamp down. And for example, the recent handgun ban from the liberals coming down and other stuff like that. So they have no problem jumping in on American politics when it's politically expedient for them to do so. Whereas when something like this happens, oh, no, no comment. I'm sorry. Like, you know, I've got a rule that I stick to and I don't comment <laughs> on American policies and I'm going to stick to that today, which makes me think that, OK, so this is not politically expedient for them or she like Christian Freeland does not see a way to spin this in her favor politically. So she's not going to comment on it. So it makes me think like, OK, interesting. So what is she concerned about in this issue that she doesn't want to comment on or like, you know, she doesn't want to get into hot water on this kind of makes me start to think like, interesting. Why does she seem concerned about commenting on this? Like normally you would think she'd love the opportunity to take a stab at, you know, Trump and maybe compare him to some of her uh, political opposition here or something like that. But no, no comment, which I, I don't know. I find interesting. Yeah, one can only speculate why she's doing mm -hmm. that. Um, it's definitely not politically favorable for her to do so um, with a, you know, a, a growing populist movement in Canada and also Trump hinting at a, at a comeback mm -hmm. and whether it's not with him running, whether he's second fiddle or just endorsing, in, endorsing DeSantis, uh, if the Liberals hope to maintain power, they're going to have to get along with whatever conservative government's coming next. And yeah, I don't know. I, the tables are turning, my friend. It, se it seems yeah. to think, it seems yeah, to no. be. This is, this is very true. And actually on that topic, I think that leads nicely into uh, the, another headline that came out today because, so just to give this the context for it, I believe it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, with, within, within the past few days, Jagmeet Singh came out, leader of the NDP, saying that his current agreement with Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party, because uh, right now they have a, essentially a coalition government going on, uh, agreeing that the NDP will throw their support behind the Liberals in Parliament to essentially give them a majority as long as they sort of play ball and throw the, uh, the NDP some bones uh, is sort of in their own socialist agenda of policies they want to implement. And Jagmeet Singh came out with a, essentially an ultimatum saying, give us the uh, child dental care program that we want by the end of the year or else you don't have our support and we might be facing another election. Justin Trudeau might be at risk to... Uh, to losing his position of power to a general election. He no longer has that uh, agreement with the NDP. And so coming out today was the Liberals saying that they will indeed fulfill their promise of dental care for kids, according to Christian Freeland, which, you know, is interesting. Uh, I feel like 
the liberals are very dependent on the NDP. The NDP have never had more power than they have had now because of uh, how much the liberals rely on them. So I don't know. Do you have any takes on this, Matt? Any any thoughts you'd like to throw in there? Well, I think it's interesting that uh, Singh is also demanding the government fulfill a second part of the deal, a five hundred dollar top up to those who receive the Canada housing benefit. Mm. So you know, how much is this all going to cost? I think it's okay. So I grew up in a in a household uh, that we were below middle class. So we relied on university programs, uh, sometimes university dental schools, at least the one in UBC, they'll offer uh, dental to children for, at a discount. Mm-hmm. And I'm really grateful that we had that because my parents couldn't afford to get braces or anything like that, or, and I had a bunch of cavities. So for that, I'm yeah. grateful to understand how uh, you know, dental impacts overall health. However, for, it's just, it seems like a little bit disingenuous to me, the timing of it all, the demand that this all gets turned out within six months is just not there hasn't been a ton of movement the director back that up. This is something that's going to take a lot of time. So, yeah, sorry. We're having on. some more of those same audio issues, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of feedback on my side, too. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, sorry, folks. We're still having, or I guess we're re- repeating those same technical issues we were having earlier, which is unfortunate. But uh, you know what, I think we, we are just in time now to be thrown to another ad break. So I think we're going to go ahead and cue that up for you while we sort of get this sorted. So stay with us. We will be right back with you. Adam Sos here for Rebel News. You know, our company is growing quickly and we'd actually like for your company to grow too. That's why this ad space that I'm speaking through right now is actually available for you to purchase. So instead of people listening to me, they could actually be learning about your company, learning about your business. If this interests you, if this is an opportunity you'd like to capitalize on, send us an email at ads at rebelnews.com. My mug? I know, it's pretty cool. So is this hoodie I got on, and you could have it on too if you check out our special website at rebelnewsstore.com. That's where you can see Freedom Focus hoodies that we have for you, beanies, cell phone cases, you name it, all while supporting our journalism where we fight to bring you the other side of the story as opposed to, you know, being forced by the Trudeau government to fund leftist media out of your taxes. The truth is, Without you and your generosity, there is no Rebel News. So again, if you like the reports that we bring you and that we also fight for freedoms in Canada, please consider doing some shopping, picking up some swag at rebelnewsstore.com. We appreciate your support. increase prosperity and improve public health, but also to build back better. If the demands from the farmers are not met, what do you think happens next? I think the farmers will explode. I'm afraid it will will be a civil war. Civil war is going to start. Up to a civil war, I don't know. I think there's gonna be farmers today or tomorrow, they go to their homes and they say, if you don't come there, we come to you. Well, I know the farmers a bit, and uh, if they draw a line in the sand, they draw a line in the sand. Well, I think uh, there's gonna be a small civil war. I can imagine it's gonna be uh, a lot of mayhem.
All right, I think, all right, I think we are back we are. now. Matt, can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Uh, yeah, I can't vouch for these uh, <laughs> Apple headphones. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. That's a shame. Well, I mean, I think we're back to it now. I think we've got this sorted out. So I think we're good. I think we're good. You know what? This, this stuff happens, guys. It's, uh, <laughs> it's all, all part of the job. So I think... Uh, so where were we? We were talking about the NDP Liberal Coalition Agreement... We were talking about their dental care plan, and so you were weighing in a bit on that, and that's when your audio cut out. Was there anything else you wanted to say that you were sort of interrupted by our technical issues on? Yeah, I just don't think it's reasonable. It's realistic. I do think that mm. uh, I, I don't see why dental isn't included in healthcare. Uh, at least some sort of access to dental is included in healthcare, especially considering how much we pay, uh, mm. the average Canadian pays uh, for healthcare. And I do think it's just, it's vital to overall health, especially since it's so closely linked to heart disease and whatever else. And, you know, just like a, a child's self-esteem when they're a kid and their teeth mm -hmm. are rotting out of their face and their parents can't help it. Like, it's a big deal. It's important. However, to insist that this all gets taken care of by the provinces in tandem with the federal government uh, before September is a little bit ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Singh must know that. So, again, it's just, you know using Canadians as political leverage, as he loves to do. So I, I, mm -hmm. I don't like that. Um, yeah. Just my yeah, exactly. I think like, I mean, you make such a great point there where it's like, if they really did care, they'd be going about this so much differently versus it's just such a clear cut, you know, taking political advantage of this, using everyday Canadians as political leverage, political fodder to advance his own agenda. I mean, it's just a classic uh, sort of scummy political move that we see all the time. Right. Uh, you know, yeah, it's kind of, it's sad to see, but it's the reality of it. And, you know, I think that also kind of ties into um, the next headline that is on the list here, talking about Pierre Polyev and the polls coming out about the conservative leadership race, because that's kind of ramping up significantly. That's going to come September 10th is when they'll be announcing the new leader, the replacement of Aaron O'Toole to lead the federal conservatives. And so this latest poll is saying Pierre Polyev preferred leader for conservatives, but not Canadians poll, which is this, this one uh, sort of leger poll that every single uh, corporate media outlet is running with, uh, running with the story. It's a Canadian press story, so of course they all buy up the Canadian press stories and run them verbatim. Every single outlet out there runs these, uh, these same stories. But it's interesting to, to see, you know, of course, they all have the same headline and they're all pushing this that, well, you know, Pierre Polyev may be the very clear front runner among all the conservative party. But, you know, Jean Charest, he's uh, got a little more. If you ask all Canadians who they would prefer, they uh, are a little more favorable. They say they want Jean Charest to win, not Pierre Polyev. So uh, I don't know. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that, Matt? I have a hard time believing that the average Canadian mm -hmm. who would not vote for Pierre Polyev would even know who Jean Charest is. Yeah. Let alone name any of his policies. So like, I mean, I don't know. I, to me, it just seems ridiculous. And, and if that's the case, like, who cares what people who aren't going to vote for the Conservative Party are going to vote for anyways? They're not going to vote Conservative no matter how you slice it. So to me, this is just like, you know, it's just more of that like sub, subconscious conditioning to say, oh no, he's not the guy. He's mm. not the front runner. Have you ever seen that social experiment where there's 20 people in an elevator and they're face they walk in and they're facing the opposite way and then there's one person who's not in on it and, and they're facing forward and facing the door like they're like kind of supposed to yeah and as the elevator goes up and down the floors more people get off and get on and they're all facing the wrong way and eventually the one person that's not in on the experiment turns around like oh okay uh, i guess yeah i think this is more of that kind of you know mind trick subconscious positioning like oh oh yeah no, he's not. He wouldn't. He wouldn't win. There's no way. There's nothing. In reality, mm. now Matt, I don't know if it's just me, but I regret to say I think we're having those same audio issues. Are we? Because I'm having trouble hearing you right now. I'm getting feedback on my end too. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I'm hearing you again. But I think. Uh, I think we're good. Say something for me, Matt. Uh, can you hear me? I got. I'm, I'm not using headphones anymore. So yeah. I don't know. Okay, I can hear that. That was weird. You were sort of cutting out for me a little bit. Hopefully, that was uh, just a Sorry. one small issue. But yeah, no, I think uh, I think you're right there. 
and um, what was the point I was going to make there? Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting how they're saying uh, they're trying to paint it as if, well, you know, the conservatives might all like Pierre Polyev, but um, Jean Charest has a much better chance of winning a general election, which I think that argument doesn't add up because if you remove Jean Charest from the equation by Pierre winning the election, and then it's just Justin Trudeau versus Pierre Polyev or Justin Trudeau versus Jean Charest, first of all, I don't know how Jean Charest would actually win versus Justin Trudeau. I feel like he just seems like such. You know, it would be like a classic example of all oh, the old white guy, boomer versus the, you know, still Trudeau with that younger, hipper sort of presence. I don't know how he would be able to sort of tag it versus I feel like Polyev would have a much more appealing message for Canadians across the political spectrum because the way he's tackling things is he's actually saying, hey, I'd be here to help the working class who's been struggling under inflation and under this all this economic mismanagement yeah, I don't know. It, it just seems like uh, it seems like a very disingenuous sort of uh, way to try and spin this poll. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's the same line of thinking that put uh, Aaron O'Toole in front as a leader. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you vote for for Aaron O'Toole if you like Justin Trudeau or you like Jagan Singh if you're a progressive? Why would you vote for a fake moderate progressive when you could just vote for progressive? There needs yeah. to be a stark opposite to the status quo to have a chance and. Mm -hmm. It's just, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I, but honestly, I don't think anybody that's actually paying attention to what's happening in our political landscape would buy this or, or mm -hmm. feel this. So. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're very right. It's, uh, I, I don't think anything like that, polls like that, or anything of the sort, that sort of uh, rhetoric sort of surrounding the leadership race, I really don't think that's affecting much of it at all. And it's interesting to see, if you look at the poll there, that the numbers, for the most part, have remained pretty, pretty flat throughout the race, and the leadership ballots are already out. People have already, most, I imagine, have already sent in their votes. So it seems like pretty well we're just, it's a, almost a waiting game at this point. Maybe the, the leaders are still trying to rake in some more donations for their campaigns. But at this point, it's, you know, we'll see come September 7th, September 10th, but it seems pretty clear that, Pierre, that Polyev is going to be taking it. So it'll be interesting to see how things uh, play out from there and whether or not we'll actually have a general election happen anytime soon, whether or not uh, that liberal NDP uh, agreement will hold up con continually right. and that plays forward, which is sort of how those two tie in. This Stevens, you know, it, it, this, this is almost misinformation because the mm -hmm. poll, the sample poll is 1,500 people drawn yeah. from a representative panel. Okay, so how many people view, uh, you know, or on the daily in National Post, CBC, CTV, who's actually using this poll to spin their narrative? Mm -hmm. Maybe not more than 1,500 people these days, no, but I, I would imagine a lot more than 1,500 people. So where did these 1,500 people come from? Yeah. How did they pull the sample size? Were they liberals? Were they progressives? Or like, who knows where they got this sample? So it, it's just, it's not truthful. It's yeah. not honest. It's not like being completely honest. And I'm not saying that they're liars, but you know, they're they're taking this poll, which is a sample size of 1,500 people, with who knows how they got these 1,500 people or where they come from, and then using that to say, oh, there's, you know, Charest is more likely to win a general. It's like this is a, this is a nothing burger. This is essentially making. Mm. Oh, sorry. I, now, actually, I think I'm having audio issues of my own here because I uh, did oh. not hear the last bit you were saying. I think it might be my own personal receiver that's cutting out on me now. I'm not sure. No? Okay. I, I, don't, I don't think we were getting you at all there again. Uh, if we keep having these audio struggles, hopefully they don't continue. But, uh, yeah, so we're going to throw now to a trailer for you, I think. I think we're going to get this sorted out a little bit. So once again, stay with us. I think we're going to be talking about, Matt, the Kamloops documentary that you were referencing before, because we do want to discuss that uh, while, you ha while we have you with us here. I think that's, uh, it's, it's a really important subject to discuss, especially when, uh, when we have you on the stream here. So we're going to throw to that trailer, and then we're going to talk about this. Well, the remains of 215 children have been found in a mass grave in Canada. Many of you know that just over a year ago, the discovery of the remains of 215 children was found at the Kamloops Indian Residential School at the Kamloops Shiswemek First Nation. But what if I were to show you that what I just said wasn't true, and that in fact, a year later, not a single body has been found? This mass grave is a painful reminder of the genocide. 
Hannity's leaders aren't condemning the burning of churches. No, they're endorsing the burning of churches. A juvenile rib bone that surfaced in the same area. You'd be surprised the number of people who say, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm a paramedic. This is definitely a human bone, and it's hmm. definitely a It's Now, Matt, tell, now, Matt, us, a tell us a little bit about this. about this. This trailer we just watched, this documentary that you and Drea uh, work to put together. Uh, tell us about the story. Tell us what's so significant about this. When the story first broke that the remains of 215 children were found on site of Kamloops Indian Residential School, um, Drea and I went up to Kamloops just with the intention of hopefully talking to some people who were there um, seeing if we could get any first-hand accounts of what it was like living in Kamloops during this time, living on or in these schools. Um, but we were met with just obstacle after obstacle. No one wanted to talk to us. Stories weren't lining up. And then following that came, a, you know, we didn't, we couldn't even begin to anticipate how this story was going to affect the fabric of our of our country. You know, between the seventy plus churches that were vandalized and burnt, some of them burnt down, um, the huge protests, uh, it even dominated, you know, the, the narrative of our, our whole election cycle. Uh, we spent more time talking about um, reparations because of this discovery than we did the economy or the pandemic when we were in the middle of a pandemic and those two were obviously tied so closely. Um, so, you know, flags were at half mass for who knows how long. Um, and the, the public sentiment is that people believe that, you know, 215 kids were found in some sort of mass pit behind a, a, a church that, that was dug by a bunch of heinous, you know, nuns and, and priests. And unfortunately, our politicians just kind of capitalized and stoked the fans of, you know, Christophobia and um, anti-colonialism, anti-patriarchy, and use that as, again, political leverage during our election campaign. So anyways, Dre and I went up there on the one-year anniversary. We weren't thinking that we were going to get anything. Like, to be completely honest, we went up there originally thinking, okay, let's just go back to the school. We'll do a report on the one-year, essentially saying still there has been no excavation, still there have been no developments, um, and that was kind of going to be it. However, after being up there after 36 hours, uh, we just we just randomly called the BC coroner's office. We ended up speaking with their chief in, uh, forensic investigator. They didn't know that we were reporters, and they spelled out a bunch of stuff for us, uh, essentially about their lack of involvement in the whole investigation, um, the, the actual practicality of ground penetrating radar, and what it can actually be used to discern and discover, and what it can't be and cross-referencing that with the actual, you know, the press release from the, the, the to come to Schwartmaker band. Um, we ended up getting a 10-minute interview with the chief, uh, Cookby uh, Asimir, uh, who had also been avoiding us for about a year. Uh, she didn't realize that the camera was recording, and she gave us a lot. And I don't want to spoil it. Mm -hmm. And again, I also don't want it... I need to be clear, we didn't go up there with some sort of agenda to like, let's disprove this heinous discovery. I mean, we felt very, you know, at first we felt kind of icky about it because it's it's terrible. And if, 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 this, if this discovery is true, like it's, it's a dark spot on our country and like no one wants to, you don't want to go into something like that thinking, oh, this is a lie and we're going to go on a mission to disprove it. Like that's not what this was about at all. It's just we weren't able to ask any question. And not only us, other media outlets weren't able to ask any questions. And if you ask any question, it was deemed as disrespectful, at least, you know, uh, possibly racist at most, even though, you know, Drea is an indigenous reporter. So that's just not good enough, you know? So essentially what is about to come out on August 31st is just us going up to cameras with a camera for 36 hours and asking as many questions as we can uh, with unconventional methods, and it's truly shocking the stuff that we were uh, we found out. Mm. Well, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to check that out because you know, like we were saying, it's a story that dominated Canadian news headlines for so many months. And like you were mentioned, like the flags were at half mast for like wasn't it over a year 
that mm -hmm. flags across the country were at half mass because of this. And then it all turned out to be that what we were told at first was not true, that there was so much stuff that was misrepresented. And so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing those uh, firsthand accounts on the ground and sort of getting the side of the story that so many people have not actually gotten. So I really look forward to that. Should be uh, should be quite good. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, shocking for some people. And, you know, I don't I'm I'm by no means advocating claiming that, you know, uh, uh, cultural cleansing is a good thing or that residential schools were all in all 100 percent fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Although some people have good experiences, a lot of people have terrible experiences. That's not what this is about. This is about the claim of the 215 children, and if they do exist, where are they? Because they need to be, you know, their families need to be notified and, and put at peace for the, these missing children. And also, what does that mean? It, it's, it's much easier to roll out such an inflammatory statement mm -hmm. than it is to roll it back. And I don't expect that, regardless of like the cold hard facts that are in this documentary, all we can do is try to, you know, this is our way of trying to heal the damage that's been done to our country by this claim. And unfortunately, again, it's, it's you know, officials and politicians using the average Canadian for fodder because, like, when we're up there, we're talking to people who attended this school and they had fond memories of the school, but now that their fond memories are all overshadowed by, you know, wow, I was living in on top of the graves of my brothers and sisters and I didn't even know it. So the damage and the the perpetuating narrative that uh, indigenous people or people of color in Canada can only be victims and nothing more, I think is very harmful. And of course we need to, you know, right some of the wrongs that have been done and move forward and, and in a way that's inclusive and, and equitable for everybody, regardless of race or gender or whatever else. However, uh, being used in this political chess game, that only advantage, that only advantage the players, but that needs to stop. So um, I'm hoping that uh, that heart shines through the Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, again, it's such an important issue, and like like you were saying about how, like the way, also the way this story was sort of perpetuated, because you know you mentioned the government officials, the politicians, everyone who sort of attacked this story or really tried to push it with an ideological frame to it, with a bit of a, a bent in the way they pushed it. Um, it was just, it's just incredible to see the contrast between that and a lot of the facts you're finding on the ground. And I think that kind of, uh, that ties into sort of the next headline I'm seeing on, on here, uh, talking about the mainstream media pushing that with the CBC. Uh, apparently, CBC to spend even more of our taxpayer dollars on diversity quotas, which is a whole other issue in itself. So let's, uh, l why don't we throw this article up there from our friend Spencer Fernando. CBC to spend even more of your taxpayer dollars on diversity quotas. And yeah, like a sub headline says there, the idea of merit-based success is completely absent in the government, which I think is something we're so plagued with, especially in Canada. It's like at every single level of our government, anything that has any air of officialness to it um, <laughs> really has deeply ingrained, like really rooted in it, identity politics and diversity for the sake of diversity. And, you know, the idea, the even, just even the mere thought of meritocracy in any sense isn't even considered. So, I don't know, I, I think that's shocking. Do you have any, like, key takeaways from the story there that uh, you think are significant to touch on? I mean, it's just, it's not surprising to me. Because um, here's the thing, you know, saying that 30% or over 30% of all programming needs to be uh, LGBTQ, visual, minority, racialized producers, producers with disabilities. Okay, sure, that's fine. But what about political leanings? Mm -hmm. Like, are you going to have a, uh, you know, a, a program produced by staunch black conservatives? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Or uh, disabled Christians? How about that? How about, we, how about, the, how about the, the CBC makes a program about that? So, like, it's just this, again, it's just like you touched on, it's this identity politics. Assuming that all people who are brown, all people who are gay, trans, or all people who are disabled, all fit into this political bubble, and that's just, just not true. And you know, all you need to do is hop outside of your bubble, to realize that. And again, this is just stoking more division, I think. Yeah. Well, no, absolutely. And I think that reminds me of a, a story uh, Sheila did. I think it was the other week where she was talking about how the CBC. 
uh, like she did an access to information request, she found that the CBC had a blanket vaccine mandate for any CBC employee, anyone in the studio audience there, any panelist who's discussing things in the CBC, any contractors who are working, anyone who came anywhere on or near a CBC facility, anywhere in the country, even when like the government didn't have vaccine mandates, even when it wasn't the law, they had these vaccine mandates in place. And I think that sort of speaks to the idea of, yeah, here's your story there. Um, she talks about how the CBC claims to be all about diversity and showing different viewpoints and how it's, you know, part of their mandate. They're going to, you know, try and give good, balanced journalism showing every viewpoint. But when you watch the CBC, especially through all of the COVID-19 pandemic, you see one single viewpoint on the of vaccines and vaccine mandates and vaccination. And they sort of create this narrative that there's this one consensus across the board that nearly every single Canadian is in favor of vaccine mandates. And how could you not be, how could you not think that, you know, that vaccines are the way to go for every single soul and there's no exception and it's just completely uniform. She points out that, well, if you're not allowing any single unvaccinated contributors or panelists or any members in your studio audience or any employees at all and you're kicking out anyone who has not taken the vaccine, then you are completely cutting off this massive segment of the Canadian population. I think to this date, around five to six million Canadians, somewhere around there, remain unvaccinated, which I think is very significant considering the pressure from all sides to take the vaccine regardless of your views on it there's so much pressure that most people will have buckled to that so i think that's an incredible number uh the fact that that many people are unvaccinated in canada and the fact that that entire segment of the population or even those who are vaccinated and still just believe in medical privacy that you know if you got the vaccine whether or not you got the vaccine that shouldn't be affecting whether or not you're allowed to do something in the public square so I, I, just, I just think that was a really great bit from Sheila there, kind of pointing out the hypocrisy of the CBC claiming to be all about diversity, but not showing, like you said, that, you know, a, a wide array of viewpoints on really key issues like COVID-19 vaccines and vaccine mandates. And, the, and one of the main problems with that specifically, although there are dozens of problems with that, yeah. is that by claiming that there's only one viewpoint and taking a dogmatic approach to something that's obviously nuanced, as you know, injuries and and lawsuits and whatever else roll out, it, it, it allows those five to six million people to, to be demonized and ostracized by the rest who have participated and, and have mm -hmm. capitulated. And you know, it's it's interesting because you hear often the the proponents for this inclusivity on television. They're saying, "Well, I, I wish I had someone who looked like me on TV growing up, growing up, because then my life wouldn't suck so much." Mm -hmm. And like <laughs> we laugh about that, you know. However, in this in the era of the pandemic and you know misinformation and weaponizing in truths, weaponizing your truth and my truth, it's actually created this. You know, we saw a second-class citizenship in Canada develop with five to six million unvaccinated people, and I don't really see that going away. Um, so, diversity of opinion and thought is important if it's a truthful represent representation and truly diverse. You know, it shouldn't. Uh, if it doesn't invoke some sort of uh, heated debate or discussion, it's not true diversity. This idea that we are all homogenized and we all should get along and, and diversity is, is purely aesthetic, like the color of skin or, or sexual preference is just, it's wrong at its core. It's just not, it's not the truth. So, Yeah, I forget where I saw this, but it was just the other day. I saw something, it was some sort of study into political polarization in the United States and they were kind of talking about the idea that one of the reasons that there's so much polarization in terms of people looking at the other side of the political aisle as you know some sort of stereotype of oh you are this you know if you're looking at the democrats oh you're just you know these emotional over emotional people who completely just go off of how you feel you're you don't care about any of the facts you don't care about effectively running the country you just are going to let it run into the ground because it makes you feel good whereas democrats look at republicans as you know the old white men refusing to accept change and sticking their feet in the ground and all of that and we're super selfish uh, and it's sort of those narratives and those stereotypes are perpetuated by both sides because increasingly people aren't mixing with the other political side. There is like, we kind of stick to our own echo chambers and our own sort of circles and we refuse to run outside of our own political circles and there's no more real exchange of ideas in the political square like you would have back in the day. Like if you throw on a news cable program today, you are so much less likely to see genuine debate with 
people featured from different sides compared to how you would have you know a couple decades ago because nowadays it's like who's going to have on someone who people claim is oh you're just some nazi because you're a republican or you know oh if you're a democrat you're just some socialist commie you want to you know run our country into the ground it's like there's just so much name calling and polarization and a lot of that comes like you're saying when you can't have that exchange of ideas, diversity of viewpoints. So I just think it's such an important prevalent issue that's it's all throughout our media landscape and sort of how identity politics has really been having those negative influences on every aspect of our society. Right, and unfortunately, you know, the those who are capitalizing off of that sort of, you know, that, ex- that uh, vicious exchange or lack of exchange of ideas, mm-hmm. you can only push, you can only pull a rubber band so far before it either slings back or it breaks. And you know, in a time when we're seeing the uh, president of the United States House being raided by the by the FBI on what many are calling fluff, um, I can, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that we're we're pushing our you know this this North American freedom experiment too far to a place that you know it, it can't it can't survive. Uh, I'm reading a book by Ray Dalio right now, who is uh, one of the the lead economists for. Uh, uh, massive hedge fund, uh, Bridgewater Associates, mm-hmm. and he, re- he released his book just after January 6th, and he was saying basically how um, him and his uh, his Ivy League uh, strategists, which is how they decide where they're going to allocate funds and money, have determined that there's a 36% chan- percent chance as of January 6th that the United States will devolve, or devolve into civil war. Wow. And that's for the latest accounts with, uh, you know, obviously Roe v. Wade, that's before Ukraine. That's before mm-hmm. any of the things that have been happening and dominating our, you know, our day to day, our news cycle. Um, but the product of that is the reason for that is essentially it's being stoked by its populism, its poverty, and its it's a, a lack of accountability by the media and government overreach into the media. And once you kind of start this train and this, which is underpinned by excessive money printing and people not being able to provide for themselves. Everyone needs a, you know, you need someone to blame. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 I'm concerned about what the future holds. I'm concerned for, you know, my niece. I'm concerned for what this looks like. And yeah, I don't really know. I don't really, I don't have the answer, but we need to be careful to mm-hmm. be dignified in our opinions and, and at least allowing others to, you know, voice their opinions, even if they're incorrect, without resulting to ad hominem or whatever else. Because, you know, if, if, if I'm if I'm being called a Nazi and I'm calling someone who disagrees with me a dirty communist, like people are going to react, you know, mm. people are going to start doing uh, the the average protester is going to become a little bit more radicalized as these things, you know. It's like if you think that the world is going to melt in five years if we don't stop burning fossil fuels, well then you should probably do something about that, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you actually believe that, if you actually believe the world's going to end, why wouldn't you tie yourself to a tree or lay down on a highway? Like that's the least you could do. Yeah. You know, so, eh, it's concerning. Yeah, it's it's very true. It's very true, and it's like I I always say, you know, put people over politics, and it's it's pretty easy to say that. Pretty hard to practice it, especially when you're in very involved in a political sphere. When you have those right. core beliefs, like you're saying, like if you genuinely believe that the world is going to end in five years if you don't do something to drastically reduce emissions. And then you see these people saying, no, that's completely ridiculous. We're not going to do that. You see them as being just in denial to what's going to happen. Um, of course, you're going to do something drastic. And same, it goes both ways. Both sides kind of see the other as, as uh, you know, ready to perpetuate some sort of crisis. And I think it's we are seeing a pattern of that's escalating. We're seeing more and more people really thinking the other side is out to get me they're out to destroy the world and therefore drastic action is necessary and it just keeps pulling right. people apart and it keeps raising tensions even more so yeah like you were saying there there is a lot of concern there i mean i'm still very hopeful that some way you know like you're saying with the uh, the rubber band it can either snap or it can bounce back and hoping so, there's some way we might be able to just, just ease the tension and let it go back i don't know cuz uh, hopefully we don't end up pulling that rubber band too far but so, you know, I'm, I'm, like you said, concerned, but also there's some optimism there that I don't know what it would be, but I feel like there has to be something that could help us to, uh, you know, ease things, let things cool off a little more before, uh, before the world ends, hopefully, you know. <laughs> yeah, we can only hope for that. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, we are coming close to the end of our hour here. This is crazy. So I think we might as well get to some paid chats here. I think there was some more we wanted to talk about, but I mean, I figure we've, we've covered a good bit of what we want to, and I think it is important to get to any paid chats we may have here with those who have been so kind enough to send us these chats. So yeah, let's jump into it here. Uh, Frasbo says, lol, breaking news. Trump says he never wanted to run for the 2024 election, but now that you have invaded my private, beautiful home, I'll run now and I'll work harder and harder to win. Join me, lol. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's interesting. Like, cause you, you had so many people looking at Trump and kind of saying like, oh yeah, he's yesterday's news now, you know, after he uh, is now sort of going in more into the shadows, he's off Twitter, he's just got his truth social and people are saying, oh, his base of support is kind of falling apart. But something like this, where the FBI raiding his home for what a lot of people believe to be just like you were saying, just fluff. Uh, it's really having a lot of people rally behind him. We had our, our guy in Florida, Juan Mendoza. He was outside Mar-a-Lago talking to a lot of the Trump supporters who came out there to protest this FBI raid. And uh, yeah, they were really, really fired up. And there's a lot of people who are now rallying behind Trump just because like, I guess it helps to to sort of push that anti-establishment sentiment. Because that's what Trump represents, I think, to those who support him. He is someone pushing against the establishment and people like that. They like that, you know, he's pushing against things like, you know, they look at the FBI and the Department of Justice and they think that they're quite corrupted. Uh, it's been politicized in how they're doing things or, you know, they see them raiding Trump's place, but then not really doing anything about Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden and the Hunter Biden laptop scandals and all of that. Um, yeah, it's a long winded way of saying, yeah, I think you make a very fair point there. Uh, this thing is done nothing but to bolster the side of Trump's base and his support. I don't know if you got anything to say there, Matt. Oh, I think you nailed it. You know, mm -hmm. and if anything, this is just a rally cry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely have a lot of impacts on, you know, the upcoming, uh, I think midterms, uh, in the U S in 2022 and 2024. So it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Uh, let's see here. King seven, seven, three, four. Does the rainbow community get bent out of shape when you move your outdoor flowers to a new planter? They're being transplanted. Hmm. I think I saw one of these jokes last time I was on the live stream talking about the trans Atlantic ocean. Not, you know, not a bad one. I don't know. I don't know. Matt, what do you think? No comment. No comment. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's not going to disrespect, uh, his friends in the trans community. Sorry, uh, King, uh, whatever your username was. I'm so sorry. I forgot it. But, uh, yes, yes. Uh, Shauna Marie G 83. Bad news. Trudeau is prime minister. Freeland is deputy prime minister. Good news. We have rebel news provide us our daily dose of sanity. Love you guys. And thank God for the blessing of your honest reporting. Well, Shauna Marie, thank you so much, Matt. You got something to say to Shauna Marie. Yeah, we can't do this without, you know, you guys. So thank you. Uh, we are a product of, of you. You know, we are, uh, we are filling the void. So yeah, please keep viewing, send us tips. There's stories you want us to, to cover and please know that none of this is, po is possible without you guys. So uh, all the donations help, uh, every, mm -hmm. every buck adds up. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so grateful to our very loyal viewers. Uh, King7734 again, about the farmer rebellion, people will no longer have the ability to heat non-existent food in a Dutch oven. I think you mean to say there. I think that's another joke. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm not really laughing at that. <laughs> okay, now I am laughing. But uh, or maybe that was a serious comment that flew over my head. But I think you're making a joke with the thing you in there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you crack me up, King. Pamela for freedom. Great podcast episode on Kid Carson show and Sarah Swain explaining the potential fall election. What could be playing out with liberal leadership and the potential for a true coalition? Interesting. I have to check that out because I've not seen anything about that. I don't know anything. Nope, any comment? Think. I haven't either. Kid's been doing really great work. Uh, yeah. For those of you who aren't familiar with Kid Carson, he was a uh, very, uh, basically a household name DJ in Vancouver on a you know top forty radio station. Who essentially last summer uh, or last fall or sorry before the trucker convoy, it was around February. He said, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the vaccine passports are nonsense. Uh, all of the, basically saying some things that I can't say on YouTube, but many of our viewers would appreciate. And since then, he's been an advocate for freedom. And freedom of speech so uh yeah uh he recently had uh drea humphrey as well on his show in the last couple of weeks so yeah check out that podcast it's mm. great episode. yeah I'll check i haven't seen anything from him so that's uh that's good to know any other chats we got there 
uh, Mel Haywire. Alberta has the Alberta Child Health Benefit for low-income families. This covers dental, glasses, prescriptions, ambulance, and diabetes supplies. Yeah, absolutely. Like we, we do have so many, you know, benefits and structures and programs in place in Canada. Uh, so I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, I find that interesting about how the pro current existing provincial programs, how those sort of play into this idea of Justin Trudeau needing to push a federal dental plan, but also have the provinces be doing it. Like, I'm not sure of all the details there, Matt. I don't know. You got anything to comment on there? I'm not sure of all the details either. I'm not in Alberta, so I can't yeah. comment on health services specifically. But I do imagine that you know, getting all of this stuff penned by September is is impossible. So, mm. you know, it's more just political theater, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, Frasbo, uh, what we have learned from BC mess is. Don't believe government or the fake news media. I've been a watcher of Rebel News since Ezra launched it in his basement. Uh, well, glad to have you as a loyal viewer since day one, Frasbo. And uh, yeah, it's true. There's just, there's so many, it's like, that's why people are so skeptical of news these days is because there's so much more narrative and agenda pushing and sort of ideological harping rather than just genuine level nuanced reporting and actually talking about some of the complex issues that are far from black and white as they're portrayed by different outlets. Right, and you know, especially with the what's, what's happening in the downtown east side. Uh, when I've been, uh, this is my, I've been down there a few times now, and I don't claim to have all the answers. I just, you know, I don't want to hear what CBC says about what the locals think. I want to hear what the locals think, and then you know, let you guys decide, and, mm -hmm. and not insert myself into the situation, but just observe it and you know, dignify people with you know. Looking by looking them in the eye and having a conversation with them, whether they're, you know, a politician or homeless, they're still uh, in, in my in my worldview and in my beliefs, they're still, you know, one of God's creations and they, they deserve that eye contact. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if you guys appreciate that reporting that we've been doing, uh, let me know. I'd love to cover more in that area. Uh, yeah, I know. I yeah. I sure love it personally. Like that sort of like human interest type stories and like just going out onto the street and genuinely trying to connect with people and ask them real questions. I really love that because I feel like that's like we were talking about sort of breaking through echo chambers and I feel like when you yeah. focus on people's humanity and people as an individual and have genuine conversations like that, I think it helps to break down those walls and that polarization. So I'm a fan. Yeah, I, think, I, uh, I think it's good stuff. But uh, oh, here we are. DRB 1313. 11th June 2008, Prime Minister Harper in the House of Commons gave an apology for residential schools. A royal commission followed and $2 billion paid why apologize two, three, four, five times? I think you make an excellent point. Yeah, that is true, and that's something that has gotten very little attention during this last revelation and news cycle. And, mm -hmm. you know, without giving away too much, um, it is my understanding that there are currently no plans to excavate any of these sites. Mm -hmm. So I will leave it with our very intelligent viewers to think about why that might be. Yeah. And like my, my one comment always on the residential school thing, especially since the latest uh, sort of push uh, that we had since that sort of discovery, the 215 bodies that, uh, you know, that whole breaking story that was really pushed. I remember thinking at the time, like, how is this news to people? Like, I guess the new thing was they were saying, guys, we actually found bodies. But I remember thinking, like, none of this is news to me. Like, I learned about this growing up in school, being told about, you know, so many of the horrors that so many people experienced in residential schools. Uh, you talked about the, like, I remember talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when it came out in 2015 and about their estimations that thousands of children had ended up dying in the schools, whether it was from different diseases or from, uh, you know, not being treated well enough uh, in certain areas given proper care or whether it was from abuse or, you know, uh, other terrible, tragic things like that. But I just remember thinking, like, like, people reacting as if they were learning about that stuff for the first time, and I guess a lot of them were, but... Yeah, I just remember thinking like this isn't really news to me. Like it's it's terrible this revelation, but I I already kind of knew this. And then sort of coming out that the bodies they thought they found may not have been the bodies they thought they found. So right. Yeah. And you have to really you, you just have to zoom out and look at the timing of all mm -hmm. of this, right? Look at exactly. the pandemic, look at the excessive spending, look at Black Lives Matter and George Floyd protests in the states, and look at our election. And then look at this discovery and ask yourself who benefits from this narrative and how does it all fit together? Mm -hmm. That's the conspiracy theorist in you, Matt. What can I say? <laughs> uh, World Z Worst Gamer. 
our world's worst gamer. World Z, I don't know, it came to my mind. World War Z, zombies, good stuff. Anyways, uh, capitalism is the issue. So many things that would enrich people's lives truly are hidden behind paywalls. Until that goes away, the world will always be shit. Well, thank you, world's worst gamer, for that bit. I'm not sure I agree with you there. I wouldn't say capitalism is the issue. I think there are many, many issues uh, there. I mean, paywalls are always annoying. I agree. I, uh, I've never been a fan of paywalls, but you know what? Sometimes if someone has a good product, and you're, it's worth paying for. It's worth paying for. And uh, please tell me what is the better alternative. That's what I'd like to hear. Yeah, I, you know, I have this issue with people who claim that capitalism is the the uh, the problem with all things at ALS because I think it elite, it uh, discounts the the inequity and the frailty and the corruption of the human heart thinking that some sort of benevolent leader will come and just make everything better and, and I just it's too much power and I think capitalism although it, it is broken in some areas it is a great equalizer and it's been proven to lift more people out of poverty than any other system and I think we're broken so we're deserving of a broken system but mm. You know, I, I've I, never heard I've never heard put that way, which uh, I kind of like, Matt. I kind of like. I think like the system is reflective of us, you know. Sure. And uh, yeah, you're so right. Well, I think I think that's it for chats. I don't think we have any more. I think we're good. So, and that's us five past the hour, nearly on time. I don't know, Matt. Thanks so much for joining us, and uh, I had a great time despite all the technical issues we ran we ran into. I think we had some real good discussions there. Hopefully, viewers, you forgive us for uh, our own failures and slipping up there. Most of you, I think fully understand you're all the best for uh, staying with us up to this point so uh, until next time we do do this every single weekday we got rotating hosts monday through friday noon eastern standard time that would be 10 a.m mountain time if you're in alberta if you're in bc it would be 9 a.m is when we start making sure i hit all those points there uh make sure to join us next time until then you know what keep it all together i hope you stay safe stay free matt until next time it has been a pleasure it has been great. God bless you all. Thank you. Cheers. Economic Forum has its tentacles everywhere at the minute and what's strange is the parallel between different countries you have working-class people here in the Netherlands and working-class people in Canada and many other countries who are who are worried about the same thing whether it be the World Economic Forum or, or government overreach. Greening our economies, that's exactly what we need to do to become less gas and oil dependent. We're talking about a reduction. Um, yeah. How high will that reduction be? And what are we reducing? Is that it's food, mm -hmm. right? It's right to the core of human survival. People are ready to, to fight back and do what they can to make sure that the powers that be don't follow through with their agendas. see now what's happening but you know we see the light yeah. and that's that's the reason why we do this and we are all one team one job you know you know we are humans we are not uh, criminals yeah.